Hi, and welcome back to Web 101. This is episode one, and today we're gonna talk about sort of the big picture of what the web is. And when we say the web, what specific sort of technologies or pieces are we talking about? Um, we're gonna go ahead and cover um, HTML and CSS, just to sort of introduce them, JavaScript. Um, we'll talk about some of the major building blocks between um, a, a client and a, a server or front end, back end, um, and introduce you to some of the vocabulary that we're going to be talking to uh, and talking about uh, throughout this entire class. So let's jump into it. So I wanted to talk a little bit today about sort of the history of the web and how did we get to where we are today. Uh, so you can kind of go back quite a ways. Uh, 1941, the first sort of thing that you could kind of, if you squint and look sideways at, say, well, that kind of sounds like the web, is a uh, science fiction short story from Jorge Luis Borges down in Argentina called The Garden of Forking Paths. And his idea was there was this book and all possibilities of decisions in, that the characters made were available at all, all times. And you could go down one path but you could back up and go down a different path to see what happens if um, something changed a little bit differently. And so this idea that things are linked together, you can go backwards and forwards and be able to see all sort of possibilities uh, at the same time was, was uh, sort of the new idea here and influenced a lot of science fiction writers and technologists and futurists uh, in, in the early 40s, 50s, and 60s and that sort of thing. Uh, 1945, so a couple years later, and we have this device envisioned called the Memex. Uh, and this really starts to look like something, maybe today we would call it an iPad, where there's this device and it stores information, but more importantly, it links information together. So um, he envisioned a device where you could put, for example, a whole lot of medical information in there. And then uh, if a physician wanted to look up a particular disease, she could then be linked to symptoms of that disease or case studies involving that disease or, you know, possible cures for disease and, and that sort of stuff. So this idea of getting information together but linking it together was uh, very key to this idea of this Memex. 1963, uh, Ted Nelson starts to talk about hypertext and hypermedia. That leads directly to our modern HTML, hypertext markup language, for this project that he was calling Xanadu. And this starts to also look a little bit like a web browser where you've got pages of information with links between words on one page can take you to a definition or a section on another page that talks about something that's related to. And so being able to jump around from one place to another um, was a very new idea you know remember at this point computers are a thing but uh, most written words and information is still disseminated via books and texts which is very much a linear format and trying to jump from one thing to another you have to put down your book and go find another book and so this idea of the memex or this hypertext was really a, a, a new and interesting idea at the, at the time so he keeps working on this Xanadu project for many, many years um, and comes up with a hypertext editing system. Um, others working in this space are starting to think about how would you author a hypertext document? You know, you can't do that in traditional word processing documents. Um, and so this uh, generalized markup language came around where we would have tags and we would surround elements with these tags and that would tell the interpreter or the browser or the display engine how to render or display those particular elements. Uh, and if you look at this, this looks a lot like HTML. You've got the um, angle brackets, you've got the closing slash, um, and you know this is really influential later on for developing HTML. Also related to this uh, in, in the er mid 80s, is um, Apple Computer released HyperCard for the Macintosh. And this also looks a lot like a web browser. You have icons, you have things that you can click on that take you from one card or page to another card. You could have lots of cards linked together in a stack. So you could kind of think of that as, a, as an early website. About the only thing that Apple missed here was the idea of a network. All of these stacks were, had to be on your computer. 
and the idea of being able to look at a stack on somebody else's computer um, is pretty much where the web came from. So 1990, Tim Berners-Lee starts working on the World Wide Web, and he writes this proposal at CERN, and uh, later that year creates the first web browser. Uh, next year, he's talking about HTML tags, so HTML is a thing. He definitely references the fact that this was heavily influenced by the SGML work. 1993, companies start to form around the web as, as a thing, and so Mosaic uh, was created, and the first graphical web browser was created, so you can have text on a screen with a mouse and point and click and that sort of stuff. Um, some folks from Mosaic, um, they form a company, Mosaic Communications, later to, renamed to Netscape in 94, and you have Netscape Navigator. This was one of the first browsers to really start to push the HTML format forward, adding images and um, sounds and lots more styles. The big thing for me back at this time was Netscape was the first browser that supported images for your background. Up until now, all backgrounds were this sort of slightly off gray color. And so being able to put this like textured wallpaper uh, on the background of a page was like so new and innovative. 94, 95, uh, people in this space start to realize that lots of people are doing lots of things and we need some standards start to be created around um, different companies start to develop different browsers and who gets to decide what tags do what and when you have a you know a, a heading one tag what should it look like and that sort of thing also in 1995 while working at netscape um, brendan ike develops javascript um, the idea that we need some interactivity on these web pages starts to to come to people's minds and um, he just basically creates JavaScript um, at, while working at Netscape. And, you know, JavaScript is, is still with us here today. Also in 95, Microsoft gets into the game with Internet Explorer. Um, and this sort of kicks off what we call the browser wars. Because now you have different browser uh, authors and manufacturers sort of competing for who's going to come up with the newest tags. Um, who's going to lull... Uh, web developers into building tags and building sites for my web browser versus your web browser. Um, and during this time, you started to see websites that said works best in Internet Explorer or works best in Netscape Navigator because they were using tags and features that were only supported by those browsers and maybe did not, um, you know, fail gracefully on browsers that didn't support those those tags and features. Uh, CSS comes around also pretty early on, 1996, as an idea to separate markup from display. Um, there were some competing options for how we were going to do uh, layout in, in that area. Also in this mix at the time, in 1996, we have Macromedia releasing Macromedia Flash. And so this was the first real uh, widely supported <clears throat> mechanism for doing interactivity on a web browser. You could have animations, interactive games, um, buttons that you could click on and that would spin around and do all sorts of stuff. Things we can do today with JavaScript, but at the time, JavaScript didn't really support it. The browsers didn't support it. And so we had these plugins, which were just complete new runtimes run that ran within the browser um, that would do a lot of this interactivity. Uh, 97, you had more progress in the standards area. We've got HTML marching along into HTML4, um, HTML3, and here's this like fight sort of between, are we going to have visual markup, meaning there are styles defined within the tags themselves, or are we going to um, deprecate that in flavor of style sheets? And sort of style sheets won out, thankfully. Um, and so the HTML4 specification said, no, no, we're going to deprecate this visual markup stuff in tags, and we're going to go with style sheets. But at that point, it was all still very experimental. Then at the last end of the 90s, we've got XML coming out. Um, you know, HTML was, was definitely a thing, and people said, hey, this could be a really great format for data interchange between disparate systems because you've got these very standard tags. Um, and then, of course, once XML comes out, everybody's like, oh, HTML should be 
XML compliant. And there was a brief period there where everybody was like, XML is the future and XHTML will take over the world. Fortunately, that didn't happen. Um, 2004, so you know, between 1995 and, and 2004 here, um, the browser market was really dominated by Internet Explorer. And, you know, due to Microsoft's sort of dominance in, in the PC marketplace at the time, there was a real danger that Microsoft was going to take over the web and not have to listen to what the standards body said and just sort of do whatever they want um, and say, oh, well, you know, if you want the real web, the full web, you have to buy a, a Microsoft compatible computer because that's the only place where you're going to run Internet Explorer. Um, and so Firefox came out in 2004 from the Mozilla Foundation, and they said, hey, you know what? We want to release a standards compliant browser. We think standards are important, and there has to be something out there besides Internet Explorer that supports the web. Um, fortunately, most of the web developers at the time were not thrilled with what Microsoft was doing and really jumped on and pushed Firefox forward. Um, and so this sort of was the beginning of a turn in the browser marketplace for, towards standards compliance and away from uh, browser manufacturers sort of inventing proprietary tags and features. 2004 also sees um, HTML5 um, coming along as a thing um, and sort of the evolution from HTML4. Um, we've got JavaScript making strides in 2006 also. You've got jQuery released as a language. You've got SAS coming around as, um, you know, hey, CSS is really great, but there were, it would be nice if there were things we could do that CSS can't do today, but we could do those with a preprocessor. We'll write CSS a little bit differently. We'll run it through this SAS converter and it'll write out our much longer, more verbose CSS, which is standards compliant. Uh, 2008, 2009, we start to see more progress towards um, standardization of HTML5, and JavaScript was submitted to a standards body for the first time. Up until now, it was a very loose specification, and browsers kind of just looked at each other and said, is this how you're doing it? Yeah, this is how I'm going to do it. All right, it kind of works the same. And trying to get your JavaScript code to run the same everywhere was very difficult. Uh, and then on the display side of things and the authoring side of things, in 2010, um, Responsive Web Design uh, was released as, a, as an article. And this was really, really influential in the web developers community because uh, remember here, 2010, we're three years after the iPhone, which was released in 2007. And up until now, the web existed on computers, on desktops with big screens and mice and keyboards. And for the first time, you know, 2007, 2008, 2009, uh, with the advent of the iPhone and Android phones, mobile computing starts to become a big thing. Um, and today is really the dominant thing. Um, and so this idea of, well, how are my web pages, which I designed on a big screen, going to work on a small screen? And the sort of ideas championed in this responsive web design article really laid a blueprint for well, here's how you can design your web application, your website, to work across displays of very different sizes. Uh, early 2010s, we've also got in the finalization of CSS3 and HTML5 coming out. So now the standards really are there and well-developed, and lots of browsers are supporting them. At this point, we have Safari is out. Um, Chrome is out, so it's not just Firefox sort of in their um, space championing um, standards. Um, HTTP2 comes out as a transport protocol um, specification. Um, up until now, we've been working on HTML, HTTP 1.1 has been, you know, championing for, you know, 15 years now up until now. Um, also, finally, in 2015, Microsoft sort of says, all right, we're done sort of pushing Internet Explorer. We'll get on the uh, standards bandwagon, and they release their Edge browser, which was their first um, you know, sort of stake in the ground for we're going to support standards. Uh, and this kind of ends the browser war. So, you know, um, you've got 20 years sort of of um, browsers sort of duking it out, but in the end, standards win, and that really has, has made life great for developers. Uh, and then in 2017, Adobe finally says, 
the 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 web is great. We don't need Flash anymore. Um, there's some major security issues with Flash towards the end of its life cycle there, and it um, it just really wasn't needed anymore. So you know it had it had a good nearly 20 year run as this is how you do interactivity on the web, but we don't need it anymore because we can do all of that stuff with native browser uh, um, affordances, which is really great. Um, so it's really, it'll be really interesting to see sort of where the web goes forward um, today, and we'll uh, explore that together. So the next thing I want to kind of talk about is some of the major building blocks that we're going to encounter in this uh, sort of course that, that I'm going to go through. Um, and, you know, this, this sort of bubble map here kind of represents the, the big pieces. We've got HTML. We've got CSS. Um, JavaScript. Um, HTTP is the Hypertech Transport Protocol. This is the communication language of, of the web. Uh, and then you've got server technologies such as MySQL or Python. Um, there's lots of pieces that will plug into those spots, but these are the ones that uh, we're going to go ahead and cover in, in this particular course as, as we go through uh, the series. So starting with what is a web browser, we can sort of abstract it a little bit more and say there's two pieces. There's a, a server and a client. Um, the server has the web content, and the client wants to see the web content. And on the client side, you've got technologies like HTML and JavaScript and CSS. Uh, on the web server side, you've got technologies like Python or MySQL. And sort of tying them together is this HTTP, the uh, Hypertext Transport Protocol. And this is what connects all of these things together. So HTML and JavaScript and CSS all work together on the client side. You've got your programming languages, your server side technologies all working together on the server side. And you've got HTTP kind of in the middle as this communications protocol that allows these two pieces to talk to each other. Like I said, you didn't have to have Python. You could have lots of different types of programming languages. Um, there are all sorts of programming languages out there, and pretty much if you like a programming language, you can probably write a web server in it. You could probably write a web application in it. Um, you don't even have to use a different language. You can use JavaScript on the server as well as the client. Um, similarly, on the data storage side, we're going to be using MySQL as a database, but there are lots of other databases. There are lots of other data stores that aren't really databases, but they're places for you to store data, and it just kind of goes on and on forever. So we're going to pick a couple of these to go over in great detail, but sort of know that if you want to do these particular tasks with a different language or a different storage engine, you certainly can. And this idea of things communicating over HTTP um, can be extended to a lot of different layers. So, you know, you've got your client talking to a caching server, for example, um, so that you don't have to hit your database and your web server quite as heavily. If you've got a really um, heavily trafficked website, you may have load balancers that take that HTTP traffic and distribute between a bunch of different cache servers that are all in front of a bunch of different web servers that are all talking to a big database cluster. And what is our client these days? The client these days is the phone. Um, and the client might be another web application. So my website might be consumed by another program, another website, that is then sending its information on to the ultimate user who's requesting something. And this can just go on and on and on and on and on. So you've got, I'm going to hit a particular website, and that particular website, in order to give me contact, needs to hit some other particular web service, and that one needs to hit another web service, and so on down. And then ultimately, all of that information gets passed back to me as, as the client. That is pretty much where we're going to stop for today. So I just wanted to really introduce you to this idea of We've got a bunch of different pieces that we're going to talk about in the class, and 
you know, sort of we can go back to our original one. I should put this one at the end. Um, but this idea of you know HTML, uh, CSS, HTTP, JavaScript, MySQL, Python, these are the pieces that we're gonna cover. There'll be multiple um, episodes on each one of these bubbles. And um, we're gonna jump into HTTP first. So I will see you next week. Thank you so much.